suppose you have a vector network analyzer that came with a set of calibration standards and you're used to using it and it suddenly occurs to you that you'd like to use it on a system that is not a 50 ohm nominal impedance. So what do you do? Well, the simple answer is you just recalibrate to whatever the nominal impedance is of the system you're using. For example, here are a set of devices that are used with cable television. They are all 75 ohm devices. These are balance. They uh, transform 75 ohm to 300 ohm. For those of you that have never seen 300 ohm, this is a 300 ohm uh, line, and this also is a balance, exactly the same as those, just a different polarity on the connector. But the old twin lead that was used in vintage television, and by vintage I'm talking about back in the 50s and 60s, uh, is was this twin lead like this. Amateur radio operators still use twin lead. Usually they use 450 ohm, what's called open wire line, but still it's a different impedance than 50. And this is called an F connector and it has a nominal impedance of 75 ohms. So what I have done is I have recalibrated my Nano VNA H4 to 75 ohms. And you see here a Smith chart showing a perfect match over the range of 50 kilohertz all the way to 900 megahertz. Well, 900 megahertz is a little above the, the cable uh, band. It's a little above the UHF band, so it covers the entire uh, cable band and quite a bit more, actually. So how do you go about doing that? Well, you have to get a set of standards. It's easy to do an open because the, you can just buy these connectors that are meant to be crimped onto 75 ohm coax. So the open isn't a problem. It also turns out that you can buy 75 ohm terminations that are loads at 75 ohms. This is one that was used uh, in the cable industry and I have a number of those. And but one thing that is a little harder to get a hold of is a short. Now what I have done here is I have folded over the end of the coax and soldered it to the center conductor so that there is effectively a short right at this line. And I have put an SMA to F connector adapter on my uh, Nano VNA H4. Now you can do the same thing with the regular Nano VNA or with the version 2 or uh, any of these. But basically the idea is that you have to account for these additional distances. And by the way, uh, there's a nice video by Alan, W2AEW, about adjusting for lengths. I won't go into that, but if you go over to his channel, W2AEW, you'll find a nice video on setting the delay so that the uh, Nano VNA accounts for the difference between calibration at the uh, at the normal calibration point, which is here, and calibration out here. Now you realize that's a very short distance, but at 900 megahertz it makes a difference. And then on the end here is a, uh, a 75 ohm termination. This is an example, kind of what some of them look like, and they, they have different uh, they look different. For example, uh, this these are 75 ohm terminations on this coupler. This is a two-way splitter that is supposed to work from 5 to 900 megahertz. 
So we're going to take a look at some of these things. But before we do, I want to uh, try moving this termination out to the end of a piece of coax to see what the effect is on the, uh, on the impedance. Okay, I have connected a piece of coax, 75 ohm coax, but I have left the end open. Let me show you what, what the connection is. There's the coax, and you see it comes out to an open at the end. Well, you see what it has done to the, uh, to the Smith chart. Now, let's attach that 75 ohm terminator and you see we're now circling right around the 75 ohm calibration point. Now when you calibrate your nano VNA to some different uh, a nominal impedance, you have to use connectors and loads that are that work at that nominal impedance. So both your open, your short, and your load have to be 75 ohm in this case. You could do 150 ohms if that's the characteristic impedance of the system you're working with. Now, what I'm going to do is hook up this, this is actually a, a duplexer intended to combine a UHF antenna and a VHF antenna into a single line. I'm terminating the UHF and VHF ports and I'm going to connect the, uh, the coax cable that is uh, produced there to the to the input and we'll take a look and see how good a match this combiner is. And here are the results. Notice that this particular combiner is actually a pretty good match. Most of this spiral is due to the coax cable. Now let's uh, try a wideband well, first, let's try this. This is a uh, this is an FM trap designed to remove the FM band from a cable system so that you don't get as much uh, crosstalk and interference from the FM strong FM signals. And here is what we get. Notice that uh, what I have here is I have one side of the uh, trap terminated in 75 ohm. Then I have the 75 ohm coax connected to the other one. Now, the actual thing we're interested in here is not the match. It's the reflect. It's the transmission. But for this video, I'm going to only stick to the uh, matching properties because the what I'm trying to show is that in a 75 ohm system, you need to be careful. Now, you see how the uh, what the Smith chart looks like. Now I'm going to take the termination off the end of this trap. And you see what happens to the uh, to the characteristics. So that is the one of the reasons that when you're using a, a system you always want to make sure that all unused ports are, are uh, terminated in the proper termination. In this case a 75 ohm termination. There it's terminated. And you may wonder, well what's all that other stuff? Well the, the, remember this is a uh, this is a trap. It's not intended to pass all frequencies equally. It's intended to pass frequencies outside the range of 88 to 108 megahertz and block all frequencies inside that range. So of course it has a fairly nonlinear frequency characteristic. And finally what I have done is connected up this uh, 5 to 900 megahertz two-way splitter and we're just checking the matching. So we have channel 0 connected to the input and we have the outputs 
terminated in 75 ohms. You'll notice that it looks very similar to the uh, just the coax terminated properly, except notice that at the beginning, at 50 kilohertz, the uh, impedance is down here. It's not in the center where it should normally be. And the reason is, notice that this doesn't say it goes from DC to 900 megahertz. It says it goes from 5 to 900 megahertz. And so what you are seeing down here is at the lower frequencies, up to 5 megahertz, the, uh, this device does not properly terminate a 75 ohm. Now remember, most of this is due to the coax, but the offset at the beginning, at 50 kilohertz, pardon me bumping the camera, is due to, uh, is due to the uh, characteristics of this coupler, which does not extend down to, to below 5 megahertz. So, what I've been trying to show is, when you are working with a characteristic impedance other than 50 ohms, you don't calibrate using the set that came with uh, the Nano VNA. You have to get a set of uh, terminations, a load, a short, and an open that have the characteristic impedance and you calibrate to that. I hope this has been of some interest, particularly to those of you who might like to use your Nano VNA or your any other VNA on a non-50 ohm system. Once again, the what you are doing is you are calibrating the center of the Smith chart to the characteristic impedance. So if that's 50 ohms, use 50 ohm set. If that's 75 ohms, use a 75 ohm set, and so on. I'm not going to do the transmission measurements on these devices. Maybe I'll do that in a future video. But it's somewhat the same setup. In other words, you calibrate using 75 ohms, and then you run your tests. But uh, I We'll probably do some more with the Nano VNA. And by the way, I'm using the H4 here. You could have used the, the regular Nano VNA or the version 2 or the, uh, I forget what the, there's, a, there's another one that I reviewed or at least uh, looked at the specs on. So there's a number of these Nano VNAs out there. Nice little vector network analyzers. I have had a lot of fun and learned a lot playing with mine. If you are into this kind of thing for $50 or maybe a little more for a slightly nicer one, you can get a very nice tool to use in RF measurements. So, hope that you've enjoyed this. Stay tuned for some future videos. Stay safe and have a nice day.